Welcome everyone to this um, symposium on the philosophy of computer science. Uh, this symposium was occasioned um, by uh, a few volumes. It was published uh, uh, this August to the University of uh, Chicago Press, uh, edited by uh, myself and uh, Marcel Piccucci. Um, we used to uh, 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 remark how suggests that we were probably uh, one of the only uh, philosophers of pseudoscience around. Uh, but when we set out the dates for this book, as opposed to pseudoscience, yeah, as opposed to <laughs> plenty of them, uh, a limited supply. But actually, philosophers of pseudoscience, uh, we thought we were a rare breed. But then it turned out there were actually a lot of people who were uh, thinking along the same uh, lines and who were very enthusiastic about uh, our idea of um, reviving. Uh, Demarcation uh, uh, projects. Um, if there is such a thing as a as a, as a fashion in, in philosophy, I think that the demarcation problem has been out of fashion for a couple of decades. Um, one of the reasons being that um, many philosophers uh, think that some ideas, some theories, are uh, so wrong, so wrong-headed that they're actually not worth uh, paying any attention to. Uh, Stephen G. Gould uh, uh, likens the, uh, the job of the skeptic uh, professionally, when it's set on dealing with pseudoscience, to um, uh, people who do garbage disposal. Uh, it's a dirty job for someone who's got uh, to do it. Uh, another reason, more philosophical reason, of course, that um, ever since uh, Larry Long's influential paper has been backlash against the idea that uh, science and pseudoscience uh, can be neatly separated, uh, I think uh, that um, lot of judgment is a bit uh, premature. Um, Mark Twain, upon reading his, uh, his own obituary in the newspapers, once remarked that <coughs> the of his death by death were uh, greatly exaggerated. I mean, you think the same applies to pseudoscience. If you think about the particulars of pseudoscience, philosophers and scientists alike are actually pretty much in agreement. You know, everybody knows where astrology belongs, where astronomy uh, belongs, etc. Um, so I think there is a genuine difference between uh, the two categories. And uh, well, spelling out what constitutes the difference is, is a job for us. So I think that we should um, you know, deserve uh, to devote more attention to this uh, demarcation problem. That's what we have been doing in this book. The uh, four speakers for uh, this afternoon have all contributed uh, a chapter uh, to the book. Um, we're going to uh, start off with uh, Massimo Piccucci from uh, the City University of New York, then um, um, Professor Sven uh, Uwe Hansen from uh, the Institute of Technology, in, uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, um, uh, and then proceeding with uh, Carol Clemens, she's a Professor of Philosophy at the University of uh, Colorado uh, Boulder, and um, and myself, I finish off, I'm a postdoc research fellow at uh, Ghent University and at the Conrad Lorenz Institute in uh, Vienna. Um, we're going to have 20 or 25 minutes out at most, um, and then we're going to have a general discussion afterwards. So if you have any questions regarding this in the talk, I would suggest that we keep them in mind until uh, the end when we can discuss uh, all the talks uh, together. So, um, Without further ado, Massimo, the floor is Thank you. Actually, I think the power is going to be second. That's right. Yeah, there was one mistake. This All right. Stop this outdated. So, um, so, thanks for coming. Uh, the next few minutes, I'm going to take on Larry Lawton, uh 1987 paper, which essentially is, is, is the chapter in the book that opens up sort of the power response. Uh, the book actually includes uh, papers by philosophers, people who are interested in sociology or science, people who are interested in history of science, and a few professional skeptics, meaning people that actually spend their time uh, pretty much full time uh, debunking pseudoscience. So it's a, it's a very panoram panorama of, of pseudoscience. Uh, but of course, we couldn't start without actually addressing the 1987 paper uh, that has been largely, although uh, I'm not entirely responsible for sort of the, the stasis in, the, um, in discussions on the location. For a while. So as you can see, I'm studying with that um, slide that says the guy says, uh, uh, I was just checking your records. 
kinds of that. And uh, you have a PhD in pseudoscience, which cl clearly it's a problem if you're trying to actually do, uh, do real science. But what is the problem exactly? Um, it seems to me that, broadly speaking, of course, the issue is how do we make sense of the distinctions that we do make between science and pseudoscience, and the left we get astrology and the right we get astronomy. Now we know that there are different disciplines. We know that one is pseudoscientific and the other one is not. Uh, the question is, well, how do we know? How do we make sense of that distinction? Um, and also, what happens when things become more interesting? Because there are some fields that actually uh, are not quite as easily classified. But there are some areas of science that are sort of borderline, and there are some areas that are currently uh, classified <coughs> often as pseudoscience that, in fact, may turn out to be interesting in their own right. So the, the interesting part, actually, as far as I'm concerned, is, is in the borderline areas, the areas that are gray and not quite as sharply divided as astrology and astronomy. Um, the second thing to make clear is why do we care? Why, why spend time uh, doing this kind of exercise? And I think there's, there's three reasons why we care. Uh, one, of course, is, is it's intellectually interesting, interesting for at least some of us. Um, I hate when people say, well, it's intrinsically interesting, because when they say so, they mean usually, usually it's interesting to me. Um, it's not just really intra intrinsically interesting. But, but I think there are a number of people, of course, as, as philosophers, as people who are interested in epistemology, among other things. One is interested uh, in this problem from a purely uh, intellectual perspective. But there are also very practical reasons to be um, interested in pseudoscience, and I know that in a, in a, in often in an audience of philosophers, one doesn't want to necessarily hear about practical things, uh, but we should. Uh, one is, of course, is that science gets a lot of money every year from governments and industry throughout the world. So it does make sense to try to understand how, not only how science itself works, but when those famous borderline areas uh, where it doesn't work, where it doesn't work as well. For instance, in the United States for a number of years now, uh, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, which funds research, medical research, it has also funded at the tune of several millions of dollars every year research on alternative medicine. <coughs> And it's a good question to ask, you know, is that really well spent money? Uh, how much longer should we be able to spend that money? That sort of thing. And I think the philosophers have something to say about, about that, sometimes more so than the scientists themselves who are involved in it. The third reason is because pseudoscience kills, or it has negative consequences. Uh, that particular picture is of a woman who has uh, a, a not AZT um, tattoo on her pregnant belly. Uh, she refused to believe, she denied that there's a connection between uh, HIV, the HIV virus and AIDS. Uh, and so uh, declined to take medications. Uh, the result, of course, is that both her and her baby are now dead. This happened a few years ago. Um, in uh, Africa in particular, this denial of HIV AIDS connection has caused direct or indirect millions of people uh, to be affected and dying. Uh, a number of African governments did not recognize it, though some of them don't recognize that connection. Uh, so th these, are, these are issues of public health. Another example is um, uh, vaccine uh, skepticism and so on and so forth, or I should say denial, it's because there's nothing to be skeptical about. It. So there are, there, are, <coughs> there are both intellectual reasons and practical reasons in terms of, of money being spent and lives being uh, lost. Now, as you probably know, the demarcation problem originated, at least in, in the modern era, uh, with Sir Karl Popper. Uh, Popper was interested actually in quite a different uh, sort of issue in the beginning. He was interested in, in uh, Hume's famous problem of induction, and uh, that's why he came up with his uh, famous criterion of falsification for distinguishing <coughs> profitable scientific enterprises from unprofitable ones. Uh, but that led, led him uh, to make that distinction and therefore to be interested in what he himself called the demarcation problem. Um, his solution to the medication problem was, of course, that science does not make progress by confirmation of hypothesis because it's too easy to confirm uh, hypothesis you believe in. And uh, these examples of pseudoscience uh, might surprise uh, people who think about pseudoscience these days, but he included Marxist theories of history and uh, pretty much every brand of, 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 of psychoanalysis among pseudoscientists. And there are some really um, interesting, even amusing uh, anecdotes in, in Popper's writings about these things where he goes to a uh, psychoanalyst uh, friend of his and, and he says, so uh, I've heard of this case and he describes this case. Uh, what do you think of it? And the guy without flinching for a second he gives the, the um, diagnosis and Popper says, well, how could you possibly give a diagnosis given that you haven't even seen the patient, you don't know the details of the case? 
And the guy responds, well, it's because of my thousand-fold experience with these cases. I can just do it like that. And Topper's reply was, well, I suppose now your experience is that 1001, uh, even though, in fact, he had not seen um, any of the, the, the patient in question. The idea was that psychoanalysis, Marxist theories of history, and everything like that, uh, things like that, are compatible with pretty much every sort of evidence, of empirical evidence. And if they are compatible with every sort of evidence, it means that they're not, in fact, testable. They cannot be um, possibly rejected. Um, what Popper, of course, famously uh, suggested would happen, or should happen, is that progress in science is, uh, in what, in what distinguishes science from pseudoscience or non-science, uh, is made by falsifying hypotheses, by rejecting hypotheses that don't. Um, his best example of a falsifiable and yet um, and, uh, scientific hypothesis that survived falsification tests was Einstein's theory of relativity, which was spectacular from uh, just about the time that Popper was. Um, but for Popper, in the meaning that the theory was true, it simply meant that it's survived in another test um, and it will live another day. Um, but one of these days, in fact, it may fail the test and, and discard it, which is the way science proceeds according to the next progress and according to the law. Now, this is all well and, and, and fine, except, of course, for a couple of major wrinkles. Um, two of those wrinkles are known uh, together as the Dewey Quine uh, pieces. There are two pieces, actually. One was proposed before Popper, uh, in fact, by uh, Pierre Lamb, who was a physicist interested in philosophy of science. And his idea was that scientists often actually continuously adjust what he calls the, the ancillary hypothesis before giving up the focal point, meaning that if the theory fails uh, the falsification test, you cannot necessarily conclude that it is a theory that needs to be thrown out. It could be that one of the other things that go into the making of the theory, for instance, the instrumentation or the assumptions made in calculating the results and so on and so forth. That could be that one of those things that could be adjusted. And so there is a, an open period of time, as the history of science bears this out, there is an open period of time during which um, scientists actually, if they think that a hypothesis is or theory is particularly worth investigating, they will actually suspend the falsification test for all types of purposes and try to figure out what's wrong and what's not wrong. If, if of course, the test keeps failing um, for a long period of time, then eventually the scientists will try to abandon it. A broader version of the same idea um, is, of course, Quine's uh, general no notion of, of um, uh, knowledge as a web, um, uh, sorry, science as a web of knowledge. Uh, in, case, in the case of Quine, of course, he went so far as saying that everything can be in play, including logic itself uh, and, and the laws of logic itself. Uh, whether you go that far or not, the idea is that things are in fact interconnected in our way of understanding the world, and so it could be the problem again. It's not the full blown hypothesis one is testing, but it's somewhere uh, along down 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 uh, down the line. Uh, and again, the only answer that scientists could possibly have to that for a challenge is their intuition. At some point, uh, they will up to a point that they will look for what may be wrong in the in the surrounding area of that web of knowledge. And at some point, you give up because the hypothesis is simply not holding up uh, to for the screw. Okay, so that's the background. Now, let me get to the focal point, which is uh, Ludwig's famous 1987 uh, paper that, for all effective purposes, marked the death or near death of the vacation problem for a number of years. Um, so, Ludwig suggested that the debate on the vacation hinges on actually three uh, what he called meta philosophical considerations. I get very nervous when one talk about meta philosophy, I think the philosophy is complicated enough. Um, it turns out these are actually three standard philosophical um, issues as far as I'm concerned, but, but he called them metaphilosophical. So we're going to go through uh, each one of them and then I'm going to give uh, a very brief version of the answer that he then elaborated on in the chapter. Um, the first one is, the first question according to um, Levin is, what conditions of adequacy should a proper demarcation uh, criteria satisfy? And how do we what criteria we use, what are, what are the other, how do we know that this criteria is actually adequate for separating science from pseudoscience? Fair question. Uh, second uh, meta problem for Levin was, well, is the rotation, um, is the criterion in question offering uh, necessary or sufficient conditions or both uh, for scientific status of the theory and therefore uh, for the pseudoscientific status of the theory? Um, and then the third one is what actions or judgments uh, are implied, followed from the uh, for the claim from the claim that something is scientific or unscientific. So once you reach the conclusion according to the criterion, whatever criterion you set down, 
what does that mean, what does that imply? Um, let's start with the first one. What conditions of adequacy? So, a lot of it is very clear. You said if you think that philosophers need to agree on whatever separation between science and pseudoscience, scientists themselves agree. He says, if philosophers come up with something different from what scientists themselves recognize as science or pseudoscience, there's something wrong. Well, no. Um, because if that were the case, then we could just go home. Stop right now and go home and enjoy a nice day. Um, I don't think the philosophers should necessarily roll, their, roll over and, and, and uh, let, let the scientists decide what, uh, what counts and what doesn't count. I mean, that's the whole, well, maybe not the whole point, but that's a major point of philosophy of science. And I can tell you this as a uh, former active science in, in evolutionary biology, most scientists don't know anything or very little about philosophy of science, and they, they just use certain tools. They don't really necessarily are very um, cognizant of what, what those tools are and how they work. So now I don't think that uh, that's too strict of a criterion. On the other hand, you certainly don't want to get in a situation where philosophers come up with um, a conclusion according to which you know astrology, parapsychology, and so on are sciences, and you know fundamental physics and evolutionary biology are pseudosciences. If that, if, if we're going to go that far from the way in which science practice and scientists uh, think, then then we do have a problem. So I think that it's reasonable that there may be, may be some discrepancies between scientists and philosophers' as, um, assessment of the issue, but those discrepancies better not be too wide, otherwise there really is a problem. So I think that that the Conclusion, whatever, whatever it's proposed by philosophy should look something like that. It's going to be difficult to see on the back. But basically what you have there is a broad classification of sciences where you get things like biology, chemistry, fundamental physics, and that grouped together in one of those clusters as really hard science. The science is stuff that's clearly undeniable science. At the opposite extreme, you get equally undeniable pseudoscience, intelligent design creation, and, uh, astrology and so on and so forth. And then in the middle, you get either pseudoscience that could in fact turn into a, a viable research program, so, such as some areas of biopsychology, for instance. Um, or you get some science that could slide back into pseudoscience. I'm thinking of issues like, for instance, evolutionary psychology, uh, or uh, the search for suppressing intelligence. Those are areas of science where you can have a reasonable discussion about you know, how rigorous are they. Certainly, they, they don't seem to be as rigorous as the core sciences, but they're certainly not as bad as anything, as anything like the, the actual pseudoscience. So something like that needs to be recovered, but the details we can, we can discuss uh, in, in, uh, when appropriate. The second criterion that is, uh, the second question is brought up, the meta, meta question is brought up by Lavin, is what, what are the necessary and jointly sufficient criteria for uh, demarcation? Um, so he says, for instance, ideally the location criterion would specify a set of legally necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for deciding whether an activity or set of statements is scientific or unscientific. Well, I'm not sure that that's ideal. Uh, in fact, I think that would be a bad idea because any interestingly complex uh, concept such as truth in science and pseudoscience probably does not admit uh, a simple definition in terms of necessary and jointly sufficient small set of conditions. We've known this since Wittgenstein started talking about uh, cluster or family uh, resemblance concepts. Uh, so I think that actually the answer to what the criteria demarcation uh, is going to be something that looks like this. This is a two-dimensional graph diagram, but it could very easily be multi-dimensional. Over here you have sort of some measure of theoretical understanding of theoretical sophistication of that discipline. On the uh, vertical axis you have some measure of empirical uh, reliability and empirical uh, fruitfulness of the same discipline. And those two things begin to separate things like, again, astrology and intelligent design on the lower left corner, uh, physics, chemistry, and biology on the upper right corner, and more interesting things like social sciences on the upper left corner, uh, high in data, heavy in data, but a uh, little scarce in the theoretical understanding. And things over here like string, phys uh, uh, string theory physics, which are very high in the theoretical context, but very low in the practical. Now, one can add additional dimensions. Uh, one of these dimensions that's important, several of our contributors brought up, is that it has to be a, a temporal dimension. The distinction between science and pseudoscience varies over time. If we were doing this analysis a century ago, or two centuries ago, or three centuries ago, things would be moving. So you can imagine in different positions. So you can imagine this as a revolving uh, cube in time uh, where fields move 
and according to what we know and how we uh, and how we figure it out. The third, you're not needing any single form of category. There is still a good. And the third question, third criterion that Lavin offered up was, what does the judgment imply? And this is a long quote from from um, um, Lavin, and I hope you don't mind if I actually going to read it um, because I think it's it's important. He says, precisely because the demarcation criterion will typically assert the epistemic superiority of science over non-science, the formulation of such criterion will result in the sorting of beliefs into such categories as sound and unsound, respectable and cranky, or reasonable and unreasonable. The philosophers should not uh, jerk from formulation of the demarcation criterion merely because it has these judgmental implications associated with it. Uh, quite the reverse, philosophy at its best should tell us what is reasonable to believe and what is not. But the value-loaded character, character of the term science and its cognizance in our culture should make us realize that the labeling of a certain activity as scientific or unscientific has social and political ramifications which go well beyond the taxonomic task of sorting beliefs into two piles. And when I read this section, I was very puzzled because it looks like Lavin wants to eat cake and it wants to eat it too. That's what that diagram says, add cake, eat it too. Um, and uh, the, the guy off the, off the left says, well, let's keep this quiet, shall we? Uh, this is somewhere in the line with Duncan Hines. I mean, it, it sounds to me like on the one hand, um, Lavin is saying, we shouldn't have any problem in, in uh, you know, basically making essentially extended judgments. That's, in fact, what philosophy at its best does. But hey, be careful because if you say that something is in fact scientific or unscientific, reasonable or unreasonable, there are some consequences. Well, good, because if there were no consequences, then what would be the point of making the judgment? It would be an entirely uh, intellectual stale, intellectual exercise for its own right. As I said in the beginning, one of the reasons these judgments are in fact important, and of course with the idea that these judgments are provisional and with the idea that these judgments are revisable, uh, but the reason they're important is because they, are, they do have practical consequences, social consequences, consequences in terms of social impact, monetary impact, and so on and so forth. In other words, I don't think that philosophers should uh, sort of shy away from, uh, for a change, being actually relevant in, in social discourse by getting out there and saying, no, actually, we do think that this is crap, and we do think this is a good thing, and here's why. Now, we're not the ultimate judge, uh, judge of those, but this is part of a conversation that we have with both scientists, of course, and society at large, but we need to have that conversation. I, I don't think it's a bad idea to shy away from it. Why do I think it's a bad idea to shy away from it? Because of these kinds of statistics. This is from the National Science Foundation. Oops. Um, these are data over a couple of decades. Um, you can see they haven't changed much. This is the degree of belief of Americans in a number of serious scientific notions. Depending on which type of pseudoscientific belief you fit, uh, they vary anywhere between 20-30% to up to 50%. In fact, according to certain statistics, certain ways of looking at statistics, almost 90% of Americans now believe in evolution. Not in a, as an entire naturalistic process of things. Half of them believe that it's directly it, the result it doesn't occur at all. And 40%, 30-40% believe that, yeah, it does occur, but it's got it's got no um, those numbers are uh, scary, but they should be. Um, and scientists have finally uh, picked up on the fact that these numbers are important. Over the last two decades, a number of scientific societies have actually um, been more and more actively involved, uh, especially once that uh, uh, certain people in, in the American Congress have actually made serious noises about cutting the, 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 the funding of things like evolution biological research, for instance. So scientists are finally becoming aware of it, uh, philosophers have been and aware of it for a long time. And actually there are cases, which I discuss in my chapter, of philosophers making a real difference. For instance, in a famous uh, case in 2005, a court case uh, in 2005 in Pennsylvania about the genome intelligent design, two of the major testing uh, witnesses uh, were in fact philosophers of science. And if you read the, the uh, conclusion of the judge, the decision of the judge, it was essentially a, a philosophy of science one-on-one with a lecture of 40 pages. Um, so we can make a difference. So to summarize, here are the answers to Lavin's question. First, what conditions of adequacy should be should proposes a uh, demarcation criteria and satisfy? Well, it should agree broadly speaking with what scientists think, but not necessarily in detail. 
Um, is the criterion under consideration offering necessary sufficient tissue for both? No, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. It's, the thing is much more complicated than that. Uh, it requires multi-dimensional criteria, and, and those criteria may in fact change over time. And finally, what actions or judgments are implied uh, by, uh, by deferring a certain belief, scientific or unscientific? Well, philosophers really ought to get into the fray here, not, not be afraid of, of providing their expert opinion um, to the public at large and to scientists in particular, and we can see what happens. And of course, if you want more, the book is back out. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Because they are uh, historical. 
competing historical hypotheses, he gives us the best uh, current explanation rather than an explanation that is logically compelled by experimental confirmation. Other example of the non-historical field sciences, this is a rather interesting for even Dyson, I'm sure you need to know a very famous scientist. He did particularly interesting work that I'm familiar with on the origin of life, the so-called double origin theory. And he's talking here about climate science. He says, I just don't think they understand climate. Their computer models are full of bug factors. The problem here, which I hope will become clear, I've let have a lot of time, is that it's not just about computer models. There's all kinds of data from the field. And they're treating, basically, um, climate science, and a lot of um, experimentalists do this, as uh, about the models. And I think that's a terrible mistake. Um, here's another lovely quote um, by a doctor. The public is surely, and this is on vaccines, the public is surely entitled to convincing proof, there's that favorite word, beyond all reasonable doubt, whatever that means, that artificial immunization is, in fact, a safe and effective procedure. Unfortunately, such proof has never been given. So you can see that these are people who are actually trained in science, they're not cranks, they're not religious uh, fanatics, who are casting doubt on the field of science, both historical and non-historical. So I'm going to start, I'm going to go through this very rapidly, because this is kind of a uh, backdrop to what I'm going to argue. Traditional approaches to the distinction between science and pseudoscience are, you know, based on justificationism and falsificationism. And what's interesting about these approaches is they both assume that the critical relation between hypothesis and evidence is logical and mathematical. Uh, in modern justificationism, Bayesian updating, uh, or frequentism, um, and uh, of course falsificationism, which is still very popular among many scientists. Um, the idea is you uh, use a logical process of deduction and ruthlessly invoke modus tollens in the face of failed predictions, and we've heard a little bit about that last time, so I won't go into it. But there are all kinds of problems in the logic of justificationism and falsificationism and in the application of them to using them as a model for actual scientific practice. And I'm just going to go through these very quickly because everybody's familiar with them. It's just to remind you of them. The problem of induction, of course, is very famous. Paradox of confirmation. Granted, Bayesian accounts claim to be able to solve some of these, but as Mike Strivens and others have argued, uh, the problem of induction really isn't solved uh, by um, Bayesian updating. And um, then we have problems with falsificationism, which was uh, the main one is the dual problem that you can always, from a logical point of view, salvage a hypothesis uh, in the face of a failed prediction by denying auxiliary assumption. And there's lots of auxiliary assumptions, especially in field science. Especially in field science, where you really don't have much in the way of possibilities on the face of it for controlling for, um, uh, and trying to identify for uh, auxiliary assumptions that are plausible. This is a more serious problem, it seems to me. Problems in application. Scientists don't reason like good justifications. Uh, Bayesian convergence requires an enormous number of trials to suppress the effects of the initial choice on hypothesis, and in many cases, particularly in uh, very high energy uh, physics, you don't perform many experiments before drawing conclusions, and certainly not the number that are required for uh, Bayesian convergence. It's, you know, an idealized model of scientific reasoning that does a, has a particularly bad fit, it seems to me, to the actual reasoning that goes on. And ignoring lip service, scientists rarely reject their hypothesis in the face of failed predictions, but instead, what Pablo would call, protect them by building with auxiliary assumptions. I talk, I speak a lot with scientists. I'm invited to talk to a lot of science conferences, and when I talk about this, I always have a group of scientists that come up afterwards and say, you know, the only time anybody ever talks about falsificationism is when they're dealing with somebody's work that they disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> so, they say, nobody ever talks about it, but they think it's good enough, right? If they like, but they just ignore the failed predictions. So, uh, conclusion one, uh, the distinction between science and pseudoscience cannot be drawn in terms of a purely logical mathematical value of the relation between hypothesis theory and empirical evidence. Now, I'm not, I, I want to make it clear, I don't think that there is a crisp distinction like Popper and Loudon uh, argued for. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't important differences. I mean, there are lots of borderline cases, but that doesn't mean there aren't important differences. And the point here is that 
when you try to draw that distinction in the way it's been traditionally drawn, what you find is it's being drawn in terms of a picture of scientific practice, the acceptance and rejection hypothesis, which really doesn't fit what's going on. So you have to ask the question, should one in such circumstances argue that the scientific practice is uh, mistaken? Or should one say there's something wrong with the model? It seems to me the place to look is the model and not the practice, because after all, it is a model of the practice. Um, so um, what I'm going to argue now in part two is the failure to recognize that the evidential reasoning of scientists involves uh, appropriate appeals to extra logical causal components specific to their differing epistemic predicaments, that we brushed out in a minute, should light on aspects of the actual evidential reasoning of experimental scientists that are problematic from the traditional logical mathematical perspective, plus is largely responsible for generalized doubts about the scientific status of the field science. They are particularly vulnerable to the kind of objections uh, to um, methodology that are um, based on a purely logical mathematical perspective. So I'm going to start with the structure of classical experimental science. And I have in mind here a very special kind of experimental science, the testing of hypotheses in a controlled laboratory situation, which is only, as Franklin and many other people have pointed out, a small part of what goes on in science. Scientists do a lot more than this. But I want to focus on this because it's the whipping boy, basically, to which the field scientists are often held up. And that's why it's my focus. This is the ideal uh, which uh, the historical and non historical field scientists are often said to um, fail to uh, live up to. So, first thing you notice is that the focus is on a single, sometimes complex hypothesis, which typically is a form of universal generalization. All C's are E's, all comments can be repeated, to be a Victoria example. And the central research activity consists in repeatedly bringing about test conditions specified by the hypothesis and controlling for extraneous conditions that might be responsible for false positives and false negatives. Important point, you don't reject a hypothesis in the face of a failed prediction. You immediately perform additional experiments to see whether or not the failed prediction is a false negative. Uh, and similarly, if you get a positive result, you worry about it being a false positive. And I think I already talked about that, uh, so let me go through it quickly. So failed predictions rarely result in rejection of hypotheses. I would argue the best in terms of attempts to protect the hypothesis from false negatives or find out its robustness. Successful predictions are not followed by risky tests in popular sense. They are best interpreted as attempts to protect the hypothesis from false positives. And the acceptance and rejection of hypotheses only occurs after the hypotheses are accepted, subjected to a serious experiment controlling for plausible and auxiliary assumptions that could explain predictive success and predictive failure. I always liked Duhon at the end of one of his articles. He says, finally, he's criticizing falsificationism, or Popper um, proposed it. Uh, he says, you know, finally, these are resolved by good sense. He says, good sense. And, that's a, and that, I think, captures what is um, going on in these kinds of experimental programs. So I want to now, now move on to what I call the structure of prototypical historical science. I've written a number of articles on this, um, and I'll just go to the end. But um, most importantly for our purposes, the focus is on proliferating multiple viable hypotheses to explain a puzzling model of uh, body trace about past events of higher field studies. Already a, a very major difference between what goes on in the experimental science. It's not a generalization but we are typically, in prototypical historical science, concerned with a particular event in the past, the end Permian extinction instead of the end Cretaceous extinction. These are different extinctions, uh, and people who are investigating them in the historical uh, research, doing historical research on them, don't assume that it's the same, that there are different instances of a generalization. In fact, there's good reason to think that the end Permian extinction uh, was caused by a very different set of events, mass of volcanism and uh, Siberia, and the uh, end Cretaceous extinction is now thought to be called by, caused by the impact of a meteorite about the size of Mount Everest. So uh, there's quite uh, different sorts of activities. Certainly, um, you don't assume that they're the same. The general research activity is very different too. It consists, consists in searching for a smoking gun, is my term. Um, 
A trace that sets apart one or more hypotheses to provide a better explanation for the body of traces thus far acquired than the other. What's important is to keep in mind is a smoking gun is not absolute, it's comparative. When you have a list of rival hypotheses, you look for a smoking gun to discriminate among them. And the correct hypotheses may not be among those hypotheses. So a smoking gun doesn't settle uh, you know, permanently any more than uh, you know, given the problem of induction that a slew of, unex uh, of, of, of experimental results with no uh, failed prediction settles it permanently. So we have the same kind of problem. This case study, I want to talk now about the algorithm hypothesis. And I'm going to emphasize that historical science is actually remarkably <coughs> successful later on here. So the claim that somehow is not legitimate science has to deal with the fact that we know a heck of a lot about the past, a great deal about the past. We know the universe is 13.7 billion years old approximately. Sure, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's only 13 billion. That number fluctuates. But within a certain range, we know a great deal about the universe. And we also know that the uh, solar system is approximately 4.5 billion years old. We know there were a uh, number of massive extinctions. We have a pretty good idea what caused them. And in fact, another interesting fact of the matter is that it's much easier to, um, shall we say, infer an ancient volcanic eruption, such as the um, super volcano that exploded in Yellowstone National Park 2.1 million years ago, than it is to predict an eruption eruption or not. Thank you. 
Um, so everything else just fell out of nobody ever, people just ceased considering the others and focused on these two. The discovery of a very extensive quantity of a rare form of shock mineral sub subsequently cinched the case for impact over volcanism because there are only two places in Earth where that mineral is found. Meteor craters and uh, in uh, the craters of nuclear explosions. And so the toppled two between the iridium and the um, shock port pretty much settled it for most scientists, even though there's occasionally uh, some. I'm going to skip this. The same kind of process went through with paleontologists. Uh, lessons from the Alvarez hypothesis. I'm going to go through this quickly. Hypothesis, oh, sorry. Hy hypotheses. Uh, are, not grounded in prediction. Hypothesis may be rejected on the basis of evidence that does not refute it. The contagion hypothesis of disease, pandemic hypothesis, the incretation of extinction is not refuted by an iridium anomaly. Uh, the extinction could have, the pandemic could have occurred before or after uh, the um, impact. The acceptance of a hypothesis does not require a successful prediction. The iridium anomaly one, could not have been predicted. Not all meteorites are rich in iridium, only those that have undergone planetary differentiation. A grounded explanatory power. Hypotheses are accepted and rejected in virtue of their power to explain versus predict puzzling bodies of traits that discovered through field work. And the key here is that the Alvarez hypothesis explains that otherwise puzzling association or correlation among traces better than any of its rivals. It is for this reason that it is considered confirmed that its rivals are no longer seriously entertained by scientists. And I'm going to show you two asymmetries now, which are causal, which I think can be used to understand what's going on, not only in historical science, but experimental science. Um, time asymmetry of causation. Most local events and structures overdetermine their past causes because the latter particularly give extensive and diverse effects, and underdetermine their future effects because they rarely constitute the total cause and effect. In a nutshell, the present contains records of the past and not of the future. Asymmetry of manipulation. Time asymmetry of causation, based on the fact that Events in the present causally affect events in the future, but not events in the past. Uh, there's no backward causation. That's the assumption here. And uh, another way to think of this is that one can causally twiddle with things in the future, but not the past. Uh, sorry, they can causally affect things in the future, but not the past, by twiddling with events in the past. <coughs> Historical scientists are disadvantaged. I'm almost done. Historical scientists are disadvantaged by the asymmetry of manipulation. Um, because they can't manipulate the past, but advantaged by the asymmetry of determination, and they exploit this in their evidential reasoning. The search for a smoking gun to discriminate among competing hypotheses, um, the asymmetry of determination guarantees there are likely to be many such traces if you're just clever enough to find them and recognize them for what they represent. Interestingly enough, there are no records of the past. In the present, historical reasoning would be impossible. Experimental scientists are disadvantaged by the asymmetry of overdetermination. There are no records of the future in the present, uh, but advantaged by the asymmetry of manipulation. And they exploit the latter in their evidential reasoning. They attempt to constrain the threat of false positives and false negatives by manipulating events in the present, by engaging in an experimental program. They don't reject, on the basis of all, all failed prediction, their hypothesis. Um, experimental reasoning would be impossible for mere observers like Dunham. Uh, I know Michael Dunham talked about intelligent trees for which they had no sense. They just watched events parading past them. They would have no ability to actually think experimentally, uh, to engage in the kind of reasoning that experimentalists do. They obviously couldn't uh, perform experiments, but they couldn't even engage in experimental reasoning. That's the point that I'm making here. Mm -hmm. Conclusion. Historical and experimental scientists appeal to and cope with different extralogical causal considerations reflect the different sides of the asymmetry, asymmetries of manipulation or determination in the testing and evaluation of hypotheses. Most. And uh, here's an appetizer. I don't have time to talk about the non historical field sciences. That's where I'm interested in working now. But they are disadvantaged by both. And they, if you actually look at their work, and this is what Freeman Dyson didn't understand. They cope with it by drawing in both. Their models are calibrated by close attention to past historical record. And the past historical record can sometimes stand on its own, and it's used to calibrate the models. And it's a, a very complex process, extremely interesting. Um, but um, unfortunately, we don't have the scope of this. So, in slide. 
relevance to the demarcation problem. To the extent that the core evidential relation involved in accepting and rejecting scientific hypotheses has traditionally been taken to be logical mathematical, and the relevant causal of epistemic asymmetries that are also involved, as I recognize, it's hardly surprising that the practices of field scientists are new with skepticism. And I just want to say that it's clear that because they do have these different asymmetrical positions at time, historical scientists are looking for the present to the past, experimental scientists are looking for the present to the future, their epistemic situations are different. They're causally situated differently in nature. And they exploit what they can exploit, the advantages that they have in order to cope with the disadvantages that they face. And so, that's it. Characterized by mutual respect. This means 
So I think that's the, the uh, rather, somewhat broader term that we should focus on. Uh, and, and then I think that it's important to distinguish between different criteria of uh, quality in science. We've been talked about the reliability of scientific statements and we can also talk about uh, scientific proof. So sometimes you can do something that is very reliable, that seems to be very correct and very reliable, but it doesn't mean very much to science <coughs> because it confirms something that was already known before. Or because it's rather uninteresting, doesn't contribute to our understanding of that which we are studying. Uh, and that is a distinction between science that is good or bad or better or worse. I don't think that has at all to do with the distinction between science and human science. Uh, I think that the distinction between science and human science is, uh, should, should focus only on reliability. If, the, if something is reliable, so that it's correct, even if it's more or less meaningful, like counting the number of trees in certain forms, but very exactly, but there is no need for technology. Well, if it's ju just uninteresting, that doesn't make it suicide. There must be something more. To it. Um, but so this means that one very important criteria of suicide is that suicide is unreliable. And I think that is a necessary criteria. Uh, but not all cases of low reliability are suicides. Suppose that someone tries honestly but fails to provide reliable results. A chemist is working day and night in the lab but fails to perform the analysis that he or she tried to perform so that the result is unknown. If that's what all that, that there is to say about it, well then it is a very bad sign perhaps, but it's still not a single sign. Or even more interestingly, consider cases of fraud signs. If it takes pseudo signs as something which is falsely uh, described as science that comes more or less with the term, then one would think that, well, then fraud in science where people claim that they have done something in the lab and they haven't. Uh, that should be a very clear case of human science. But if you look at the literature, people distinguish between these so that fraud in science is almost never called human science. So what is the difference? Well, in my view, the, there is a major element, missing element in the cases of honest but failed attempts and of fraud. And the missing element is a Gideon doctrine. So that pseudoscience is characteristically uh, something that has a Gideon doctrine. Uh, a doctrine that uh, uh, is not, uh, that does not uh, fulfill the requirements of, of science. So that would then be a sort of a definition of simple science, that one could define simple science in terms of it being unreliable and that it has a, a deviant uh, doctrine. Uh, but let's have a look at what more exactly does this deviant doctrine mean. Uh, we would normally say that someone claims that something is science and it is not science and they have this deviant doctrine and, and okay, then that is pseudoscience. But there is one very interesting 
case which shows that this is not quite what it's about. And that is the case of people in what we traditionally think of as typical pseudosciences who don't claim that what they are doing is science. We have astrologers who say that uh, science is not good. Science doesn't provide any reliable knowledge. Astrology provides reliable knowledge. That's why you should look for it. Or you can, you have some, a whole lot of things to say that they are doing the real medical science. And then you have other whole lot of things who say that, well, um, medical science isn't very good. Scientists are wrong most of the time. Uh, so what we should do then is to do more wrong things instead because it's, uh, it's more reliable. Uh, and would that then not be pseudoscience? Because I don't claim that it's science. Uh, if you look at the uh, literature on pseudoscience written by people who try to expose it, you will find that typically these are called, uh, the, the, these people are called pseudoscientists, although they don't claim to be scientists. Is that unfair? Well, I, I don't think really it is. If we go for an epistemically coherent uh, definition of science, like the one I, I uh, mentioned before, named it as, produce, as that which provides us with the most reliable knowledge in different areas. Because if we look at, them, look at it like that, well, then pseudoscience is not necessarily. Uh, characterized by someone saying, I am doing science, it is, so, it is sufficient that they are saying, I am providing the most reliable knowledge in this area. Uh, so, and then the reason why it can still be called science is that we use the term, and the term science to know the most reliable knowledge in uh, that's very brief how I uh, would like to define the science. Uh, there is one characteristic of it that you might think of as um, a disadvantage, namely that it is not very precise in the sense of being capable of determining in individual cases what is human science. Because traditionally we would think of uh, a definition of pseudoscience as something that we can then directly apply without further ado, so that we can, for instance, apply uh, the criterion of uh, falsifiability and then we can determine whether something is falsifiable or not, and from that we can determine whether it is uh, science or not. Whereas if I say that reliability is here and then we have the additional work to do for finding out uh, what is the most reliable knowledge that we have. But I think we in fact have a choice. We have a choice between a timeless and general definition of social science and one which is methodologically precise. And I don't because I don't think we have both. And the reason for that is very simple. And I mentioned at the beginning, it has to do with the fact that science uh, does change radically, and that it's made to strengthen its ability of radical self improvement. A self, a self improvement that can be so radical that it reaches to the not only methods but also broader basic methodologies. Uh, principles for what we consider to be uh, acceptable explanation or not an acceptable explanation. A couple of hundred years ago it was self-evident that uh, uh, divine uh, influence could be a reasonable explanation. Now that is excluded from science. But then uh, radical phenomena were not to say that something was radical was not, was not taken to be an explanation. They use randomness as something that explains a phenomenon like it's 
these are very fundamental changes. Uh, and if we want to have a definition of science or a, or a clarification of the distinction between science and pseudoscience that uh, goes to that level of explaining what is a good methodology and what is not a good methodology, uh, if we want to have something like that, then we have to accept that the definition cannot uh, be timeless because things change over time. And we probably also have to, to accept that what is very relevant for one discipline is not all that's relevant for another discipline. So if you want to have a definition that is relatively stable over time and across disciplines, then I think we will have to have a definition that does not uh, specify the methodologies. So based on that, I would say that we have the choice between uh, a very general definition like the one I mentioned and one that is more specific and the specific one we will then have to accept that it is uh, something that can change just as much as uh, science can change. I'm not claiming that we only need one of these two types of definitions. I still think that we need a lot of work on the criteria of scientific quality and criteria of reliability. Uh, these criteria will have changed as we learn more and they will have be uh, very different in nature uh, in different uh, disciplines. Um, so I would say we need both of what I've tried.
uh, outside uh, of the uh, category confines of science should be uh, dismissed as pseudoscience. Uh, things that are uh, non scientific but not pseudoscientific. And if you go back, you go back very quickly to um, uh, one of the, you know, uh, the formulations of the problem that um, uh, instigated the modern version of uh, embarkation. Um, in, uh, in, in Popper's uh, Logic of Scientific Discovery, which was published in, in German in 1934 uh, already, you, you uh, see that he's mainly interested in uh, the distinction between empirical sciences on, on one hand and uh, such disciplines or such endeavors as metaphysics and mathematics and logic and on the other hand. And it's notable that um, although Popper thinks that metaphysics, for example, is not scientific, he does not see that as a reason to dismiss metaphysics out of hand on the contrary, he was actually arguing against the logical positivist who equated um, with metaphysics with um, meaningless twaddle. So Popper thought that we have to acknowledge that metaphysics is non scientific, but it does not mean that it's completely uh, worthless. So, in a way, his, his distinction um, was um, relatively neutral. It was not, it had not the, the, uh, the knowledge that the dynamics that would take uh, later on, especially in the way that his criteria of falsifiability was, was used as a, uh, you know, as a weapon against pseudoscience, as, as normal criteria. And indeed, you see in conjectures and refutations, um, uh, Popper starts out with um, his, his, his fascination with um, a couple of theories that were involved then, or making headlines on the one hand, Einstein's uh, theory of uh, uh, special relativity, and on the other hand, <coughs> theory of uh, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis and certain Marxist theories. So uh, Paul started out with the idea that there was something suspicious about Freudian theory, something, uh, you know, uh, something fishy, and he wanted to sort, sort out he wanted to pinpoint what exactly uh, was, uh, was the underlying problem. Then he came up with um, uh, this criterion of uh, falsifiability, uh, which he used to dismiss those theories, not, not as, as uh, valuable. So not scientific, but really as suicide, as it were, uh, the, the term uh, pseudoscience uh, pops up. So, um, I think that we should distinguish between those two different strands um, that are uh, often uh, inflated or that are, uh, uh, you know, brought together under the umbrella term of the de demarcation project. So on the one hand, we have a, a normative demarcation uh, issue, which is one with real teeth. Uh, the one that distinguishes genuine uh, bona fide science uh, and pseudoscience, and then you have uh, uh, the territorial uh, demarcation problem. Uh, the normative demarcation problem um, is, is, well, I call it normative because the term pseudoscience is intrinsically derogatory. There's nobody who, you know, who uh, wants to, uh, uh, to have a PhD in pseudoscience as in a uh, muscle cartoon, or who is proud of being a pseudoscience is something that people use to uh, to, brand, uh, to uh, brand each other, you know, to, to dismiss each other's research or each other's theories. The, uh, the territorial demarcation uh, uh, project, uh, by contrast, is more concerned with disciplinary boundaries between philosophy, for example, metaphysics, or even everyday reasoning, and it does not involve epistemic warrant per se. So, uh, the decision where certain theory, certain claim belongs, on which side of the line it falls, does not immediately have a bearing on its uh, reliability. Warrant. I think that uh, the demarcation, the normative demarcation issue, is the only one that is worth pursuing, and luckily it's also the only one that has to be practical and solvable. Um, though I admit that um, there is no crisp and clear dividing line, um, uh, and that neither in the, demo uh, the normative uh, demarcation um, line and, and nor, uh, nor in the territorial demarcation line. But there are additional categorization problems in the territorial demarcation uh, problem that make it uh, less interesting to, uh, to pursue. Uh, I think that those territorial uh, boundaries between science, metaphysics, science and philosophy, science and humanities, for example, are largely pragmatic. And sometimes they are just an artifact of the language we have to speak. As Ben said, in German we have a more encompassing, more inclusive word, uh, uh, Wissenschaft, which is um, uh, has, has a slightly different meaning than science in English. So I think that it has um, little epistemic import. I don't think that it's completely uninteresting. There are definitely interesting methodological differences, for example, uh, as Carol said, between uh, uh, historical sciences and uh, field sciences. 
Uh, but I don't think that they um, they are relevant when we think about epistemic warrants, the reliability of claims, and I think that it's much more difficult to, uh, to pull them apart uh, than it is in, in, in the moment of demarcation uh, uh, problem. So, um, I'm going to give two examples of um, philosophers who have, <coughs> as I see it, inflated the two pro uh, projects and have spread it uh, or have caused a lot of confusion uh, by two years ago. Uh, Larry Long would be my first case, and then I'll move on to uh, the issue of methodological nationalism, and uh, Robert Pannock would be the uh, well, main mean, target there. Uh, um, very quickly, first, why I think that the, the, the territorial problem is, uh, is uninteresting. Uh, firstly, I think, uh, let's talk about the distinction between science and philosophy. I think that it's very difficult to disentangle uh, philosophical elements from science, uh, the idea that you can. You conduct scientific investigation without any kind of philosophical background, without any kind of uh, philosophical perspective, is, is misguided, it's an illusion, I think. There's always some sort of, um, whatever you want to call it, philosophy involved. And on the other hand, the other side of the coin is that pure a priori philosophy is, uh, well, I wouldn't say that it doesn't exist, it certainly does, but I think it's mostly sterile from, uh, uh, from a nationalist perspective. I think that good philosophy uh, always has to take into account uh, the um, the best up-to-date uh, scientific knowledge that is uh, available. Uh, so what we see, if we compare science and philosophy, uh, is that not only are they continuous, which is what science and pseudoscience are, but they're also interdependent. Science relies on philosophy and vice versa. You don't see that in uh, with science versus pseudoscience. It can be continuing all right, but the astrologers, uh, I mean, astronomers are not waiting for the latest results in astrology to uh, you know, to, uh, to pursue their, their research, to see that there's a, there, those are two independent fields and there's not, not a lot of interaction uh, in between uh, each other. Uh, okay, um, on to Larry Lovell in his um, paper on the demise of the demarcation problem. I think he conflates uh, the two strands, the two different versions of the demarcation problem, uh, and he discusses what, and if you analyze the text, you see that he discusses. Um, problems with either of those versions and he uh, treats them as equally damaging to the demarcation problem in general, the generic problem. And he, um, so he treats the two, problems, uh, the two projects uh, in a way as interchangeable. Um, and you can see uh, how he does that if you consider two, uh, two traditional solutions that have been proposed to the demarcation problem. Um, first, he discusses uh, falsification, and his, his main beef with falsification is that it calls uh, scientific uh, status to, well, uh, not to find a point of plain bullshit, such things as uh, the idea that the Earth is uh, 6 hours years old, almost created in 6 days. Uh, so, his, his uh, objection there is that those claims are strictly speaking scientific, according to Popper's criteria, because they are falsifiable, though, uh, though of course, roundly refuted. Uh, he calls Falsification is for that reason the toothless one because it has no normative force. Uh, I think that problem can be uh, dealt with, um, not even within the proper framework, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but what you see when he moves on to the next proposed solution, well tested this, he has a different objection. Um, the problem with well testedness, according to Long, is that it fails to exclude patently uh, non scientific knowledge, such as chess strategies historical claims, military status, etc. Those are the examples that we give. Um, he thinks that this is a problem because those are obviously, obviously uh, not treated as scientific. So I don't know how he can make that distinction if he doesn't believe in demarcation, but let's just, let's just give that. Um, but the problem is, um, if you relate the two objections on the last slide, on the previous slide to each other, uh, I don't think they're compatible. I don't think that the two requirements can be fulfilled at the same time. Because if you come up with a demarcation line that succeeds in excluding those well-tested knowledge claims from the category of science, military strategies, uh, you know, uh, chess strategies, etc., then you end up with a toothless wonder again. Because of course, then the problem loses all uh, its, its normal force again. So um, there's another case there that Bob wants to have, and, and, and he too there was there was one in the first half, but it was a different one. He's going to have very fat. Yeah, he's just getting prepped. Well, it depends on what he does with it. Um, so you see that the, the two, so the normative and the, the territorial problem, 
or intention of each other cannot be fulfilled uh, at the same time. Um, another uh, uh, illustration of the confusion deriving from uh, conflating the two different strands within the demarcation problem is um, the concept of methodological natural. Uh, most of you would probably be familiar with it, uh, the basic idea. Um, it, it's a philosophical uh, principle uh, that, uh, according to which science is, by definition, restricted to uh, the natural domain. It can only uh, investigate natural phenomena and it can only uh, come up with natural explanations for those phenomena. It has no appeal, it can make no appeal whatsoever to the supernatural. And also, this is important, uh, because of that, uh, it has no authority whatsoever to pronounce make pronouncements in the supernatural domain, so just it falls outside of its proper, uh, proper domain. Uh, this has been used by philosophers such as uh, uh, Robert Bannis, but also by uh, a number of scientists uh, to, to counter uh, pseudoscience, in particular uh, intelligent design and creation, uh, and also to reconcile science and religion. We see that the, the, the promise it holds for uh, reconciling science and religion uh, is obvious because if you car carve out a special niche for supernatural supernatural domain that science cannot touch, then you know you uh, you you, uh, you have a way to uh, to pull the two domains apart and, uh, and to reconcile them uh, by doing so. Um, I think that this is confusing. This whole idea of methodological naturalism is confusing blend of uh, normative and territorial elements. Um, on the one hand, it's used to reject pseudoscience. It has clearly it has clearly a, a normative force. Um, if you, you can see it if you. If you, uh, you know, you um, see in, in under what circumstances it has been applied. But on the other hand, uh, it has also a, a, a clear uh, territorial dimension. Robert Bennett, for example, uh, is, uh, is, is careful enough to point out that uh, science, uh, according to him, uh, or according to the principle of methodological natural, is scrupulously neutral about the supernatural. So there is a domain, the supernatural, well, they all exist, we don't know. Uh, at least as scientists, we, we, we can have no say uh, on the matter. Uh, it, it is the, the, the proper domain of, well, philosophers, uh, 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 physicians, uh, the, uh, theologians, etc. Uh, there are a number of problems with this uh, idea of methodological nationalism. Uh, I'm, I'm going to um, briefly uh, you know, uh, list some of them. Um, it's not immediately clear to me why a supernatural miracle claim kind that uh, religious believers uh, put forward, why that would be um, intrinsically unscientific if, um, if, a, if, a, if a supernatural invention in, in the natural world, in the material world, has empirically detectable, uh, detectable consequences, I don't see any reason why we would not be able to uh, investigate that with scientific means, and Bales has written about this uh, in our volume. I also think that inadvertently, this principle of methodological natural does a disservice to philosophy, because it suggests that uh, only those theories to which we attach the label science can have epistemic authority. You know, it's only science matters, and science has, has, has no bearing on metaphysical issues or on uh, discussions about the supernatural. That is, you know, something between the spare time and as a philosopher. It's more a matter of a personal opinion, but it's mostly harmless. It's, it's, you, you cannot decide by scientific science means. The whole idea of reconciling science and religion uh, is uh, dependent on this. Idea. Uh, thirdly, I think that the, the concept of the supernatural um, is so elusive and ill defined that uh, I think it's, it's a bad idea to, to uh, erect any kind of um, philosophical argument on its shoulders. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's ill advised to use it in, uh, in an attempt to solve uh, the demarcation problem. Um, you can give a ballpark definition of the supernatural just to capture what religious beliefs are getting at. I don't think that you can, you know, that it's of much philosophical use precisely because it's so uh, vague. Um, so in general, um, I would say that the whole concept of the supernatural as part of a uh, uh, solution to the demarcation problem is a red herring because it bypasses um, underlying epistemic problems um, with, for example, the Delson design creation, which are not directly related to that label that we just we, we stick to the theory. The fact that it's, it is uh, supernatural. Um, I have no time to go into this, but I would, in general, I would say that um, the, the problem with this explanation is that they're empty. Uh, they, um, 
they explain everything and nothing. Uh, they're completely ad hoc. They don't uh, uh, offer any kind of uh, experimental reward. Uh, they, they are um, uh, completely um, uh, without uh, scientific merit, but not so much because they are supernatural. Uh, I don't think that the kind of problems that um, intelligent design suffers from are intrinsic to uh, supernatural explanations, and I also also don't think that they're exclusive uh, to supernaturalism. You can have the same kind of uh, issues uh, with it, in, in a perfectly natural context, for example, conspiracy theories or Scientology, you see that we have the same problems with that happens with empty explanations um, or, um, <coughs> um, or relevant that even when the concept of the supernatural is not involved. Um, another reason, I think, for downplaying uh, the, north, the, the territorial uh, problem and paying more attention to the phenomenon of the demarcation job is that there is um, um, a similar or an, an equivalent normative demarcation uh, problem within uh, what you, you can call philosophy or metaphysics um, or the humanities if you want to make finding great distinctions. Um, as, as Sven said, there's, uh, it would be very misleading to invent a new term for uh, uh, Holocaust denialism, for example, uh, because uh, you know, if you want to call it pseudo humanities, that um, um, that uh, obscures the underlying epistemic problems, which are actually very similar to, to more uh, to tra traditional pseudosciences like uh, astrology. Um, conspiracy theories, for example, are well, you can call them attempts at scientific knowledge. You, you can call them whatever you like, but, but I think. Uh, the underlying extent problems are largely similar. Um, uh, David uh, uh, Aronovich called them uh, Pluto histories, um, such as uh, the idea that 9 11 was an inside job for them, uh, the, the, uh, the Holocaust and the habits, etc. Um, you'll see that um, if, if you get down to the, the epistemic issues, that you have uh, similar distinctions, so that Holocaust annihilation and intelligent design creation and astrology, for example, have more in common with each other than they have with their respective scientific counterparts, astronomy, uh, World War II history, and, and engineering theory. Um, I would even say that we have a, um, a similar distinction in philosophy. Um, very briefly, um, in, in, in some um, branches of postmodern philosophy, um, one of the issues that is often raised is the Except for ambiguities and equivocation, uh, which make the whole theory of up and a moving target. Um, I think it's fair to, to talk in terms of pseudo philosophy, um, but I think it's important to, to, uh, to note that exactly the, the problems of conceptual ambiguity uh, all, all, uh, also surface in, uh, in pseudoscience, and, and I think that they have the same protective rationality to make the theory into a moving target, they make it very difficult to. Uh, to, uh, to criticize. So I think that there are similar epistemic problems in all those domains, uh, and that is the reason, again, for um, highlighting the importance of the, uh, the normative demarcation um, problem. So although you can think of science and pseudoscience as two ends of the spectrum, um, I completely agree with that there are a lot of uh, borderline cases, but there are also a lot of clear cut cases. Well, most of the things that I mentioned, like astrology, uh, homeopathy, um, intelligent design creation are clearly on the, on the pseudoscience and, and the wall. Um, so although we have to keep in mind that there is a continuum, I think it's also useful to, uh, to think about demarcations in terms of the, of the lower diagram. So you have science and philosophy, for example, on the left hand uh, side, on the left side of the normative uh, uh, dividing line, which are mutually uh, uh, interdependent, uh, which rely on each other, and Form of continuum, and then on the other hand, you have pseudoscience and pseudo-philosophy, uh, which are really different uh, creature altogether. So, including slides, um, I think we should distinguish between the normative and the territorial problem. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we should uh, devote more attention to the normative uh, demarcation problem, although we should keep in mind there's no silver bullet approach, there's no small set of necessary and sufficient conditions that will do the job. Um, we should keep in mind that pseudoscience. Uh, is um, a no, heterogeneous uh, category, um, but just as also as some sort of appetite, I think one of the 
the keys to solve to, to cracking the normative demarcation problem is uh, the fact, as, as Emma already mentioned, that pseudoscience, this is only a comfortable term, is trying to imitate, is trying to, um, um, uh, is, is trying to do what science does, but, 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 in a, uh, but fails to do so. Right? so um, and I think if you approach the, the issue in those terms, that there are certain uh, diagnostic criteria that you can use um, to tell when the doctrine, for example, is falsely, uh, uh, falsely presented as science, has false uh, scientific uh, uh, pretensions. Uh, so uh, this and, 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 rel and similar issues are explored in the book once more, um, a bit of self promotion and then we're going to stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. 
need to get away from this idea that uh, you have these crisp distinctions. I'll just say one more thing. This is really a problem in astrobiology because everybody wants to define life. And then they're going to design their instrumentation when they go to Mars based on a definition of life, and they run into terrible problems. Uh, I think they yeah, I wonder about the uh, presentation of most of you is very much emphasizing science versus pseudoscience, whereas I think the real fruitful debate is about scientific versus pseudoscientific behavior. Because if you make that distinction, then you can discuss with, let's say, parapsychologists and say, well, you could do uh, your subject matter in a really scientific way, um, and but actually you do it in a non-scientific way. And similarly for all the other famous uh, areas which are classified as pseudoscience, most of them you can make sense of trying to, to do that in a scientific way, and then it's perhaps a possibility to get in contact with, with those people, because otherwise, in just classifying the, the enterprises, I think it's not really very fruitful in communication with them. Uh, what you're hitting on, on is the fact that in, fact, in, in uh, uh, some of the other authors of the book, there are about 27 chapters or something like that, some of the other authors are interested more in the sociology rather than the philosophy science, and they get very much into what you're talking about, the sort of behavioral patterns as opposed to sort of the epistemic form. We see that as both of those as part of, of a meaningful um, uh, project here. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, actually they are enforceable because um, uh, the extent of criteria themselves, as Ben pointed out, do evolve over time and they partly evolve because, because it's, it's a societal effort, both the scientific one and the pseudo-scientific ones. And these, these are human beings getting together and, and agreeing on certain norms and they change their behaviors over time. So I think you're absolutely right, but I, but I don't see those as separate more as, as yeah, I think, for, for example, with respect to uh, parasitology, uh, I think even more important than the specific methodological uh, protocol that is, that, is, that is followed is, um, it's also a protocol, but even more important than that is what happens when an experiment fails. Uh, because then it's, it's, you, uh, you, you have to delve into the, the psychological makeup of people who uh, who could try to find, um, for example, a talk explanation for why it failed, who could try to um, give it a twist so that it still is turned into a confirmation of the theory. And I think you're exactly right that there's no way to, uh, in which you can restrict yourself purely to the, you know, the, 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 um, the formal uh, properties of the theory and, and, and uh, keep you know, those separate from psychological and, and the, the cognitive factors of the people who, uh, who are defending it. It's ironically, uh, Larry Long in his, uh, in his papers on demarcation would not leave any room for that kind of complication because he was actually, he would not, ironically, he's not an old fashioned, um, uh, well, it's called a positivist in, in, in that regard because he, uh, he said that the theory you know, should be evaluated purely on its own merits and, for example, ad hoc behavior in the face of uh, apparent reputation. That is a that, that is a matter of psychology, that is uh, uh, something that we, we as philosophers, when trying to crack the demarcation problem, should not be uh, interested in. I think, so he, he's actually, um, he's, um, uh, let me say that, you know, he's uh, stacking uh, the problem against uh, demarcation <coughs> by deciding, uh, you know, uh, even beforehand that, uh, uh, you know, by standing up the whole discussion in, in, in terms that are to solve. It's much more complicated, and I agree that we should talk about behavior and about uh, psychological factors as well, um, because that's what constitutes the whole enterprise. It's not so much parapsychology. You know, even a skeptic can conduct uh, an experiment trying to establish the, the existence of the side, for example, and it can be perfectly okay. It's what happens afterwards, and it's the sociological dynamic of the field that is even more important. We got one person here, one back there, one in the front. A more. Uh, I just wanted to make, mention, of course, that you clearly got the idea that uh, Larry Lauden is the whipping boy here. 
uh, in, in this project, uh, we did ask Eleven to participate to the book. Um, and I have a copy of his email that says I have nothing else to add to the book. So, <laughs> so we're covered on that, on that part. So there was a question somewhere over here. Yes. yes. Uh, I had some difficulties uh, with uh, Sven Ove Hansen's uh, talk, and there were two points. The first one was about the deviant doctrine. And the first explanation you gave, uh, but I don't know whether that was really serious, that, that was a deviant doctrine is something that doesn't fulfill the criteria of science, so that sounds a little circular. And the second thing is um, every scientific doctrine, almost every scientific doctrine, is a deviant doctrine. If you look at Newton, it was a deviant doctrine relative to Cartesianism. If you look at quantum mechanics, it was really a deviant doctrine relative to classical physics, and so on and so forth. So I wonder what sort of job uh, the idea of deviant doctrine, apart from the problem, from difficulties of defining it all, rather than explicating it. So I don't see what, what sort of job it can do. And the second one was, I think you said, but I'm not sure, that the most reliable knowledge in an area, that's scientific. Um, and there you run into the problem uh, that someone else brought up, namely, for instance, chess theory. I mean, this is really the most reliable things. And also, by the way, the most reliable knowledge I gained today of finding back to my hotel. I'm, this is really reliable, what I know now. But I think I'm not a scientist by knowing my way back to the hotel. Okay. Uh, first question about deviant doctrine. It's not circular because uh, what I'm aiming at is something that deviates from science. So when I say that pseudoscience has doctrine, it deviates from science. I'm not defining science in terms of pseudoscience also. If I did that, it would be circular. I'm not. So therefore, it's not circular. Uh, so what is deviant doctrine then? Deviant doctrine is deviance from science, which I, as I said, I think of as the most reliable knowledge that we have about in a particular area. Uh, and of course, every definition has a problem that they have to define again and again and again the terms that to use to define it and define the terms and so on and so on. But uh, I don't think there is a circularity. Science is characterized by doctrines that deviate from uh, those of, of, of science. And of course, that also answers the other problem, namely, when I say deviate, I mean deviate from science. Uh, Newton did not deviate from science. So, uh, uh, there, and, 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 I mean, there, there is a, a huge um, well known. Understanding, which I'm not accusing you of, but people think that uh, people come up with new great scientific ideas were uh, typically regarded as stupid and assumed to assume scientists at the time and so on. They were not. So, so, it's not, so there's no reason to say that, that these theories, like Newton's and so on, were deviant from science. They were well accepted parts of the science at the time. Uh, yeah, yeah, perhaps this is historically false. I mean, if you look at Hooke's and Leibniz's reaction to Newton's, uh, to Newton's introduction of the concept of force, they said that's falling back into the Middle Ages. And it took 50 years until 1740, until the concept, Newton's concept of force was uh, accepted. And then people just gave up the problem of explaining what force is. It was deviant, and the best physicists of the time thought it was somehow really deficient at that time. And they might have called it pseudoscience. Hmm? The they science. might have called it pseudoscience. That's oh. right. I'm not so sure of that. But can, I think well, read the research literature. So you can have, um, you know, uh, some people say that all politicians are crooks, and, and sometimes the charge is justified, and sometimes it isn't. But just because it was sometimes, uh, you know, the charge was sometimes made and turned out to be not justified, doesn't uh, diminish the, the usefulness of the concept in that case. Maybe the early critics of Newton thought he was deviating from, you know, uh, from established science, but they turned out to be wrong, or, or, or maybe initially they had the arguments, but you know, they, they were on the wrong side of history. So maybe even if you're right, I mean, and this is of course a historical, uh, historical matter, that sometimes the, the concept of pseudoscience was used uh, improperly, like rationally to discredit any novel ideas, that 
I don't see how this affects the, the, the usefulness of the term itself, too, so I suggest as much as with the group sample. I want to move on. It's, it's an interesting discussion. If we have sound check, can use this argument. One in the back and one in the front. I also wanted to make clear another, uh, another sort of uh, thing. Again, the book is 20 plus more chapters. We don't all agree on everything. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if, if you join us for drinks later, you will have, you will witness or participate to an interesting discussion between Martin and, and myself about the supernatural stuff that he was talking about. I think he's wrong. But, um, so, so you, you, you don't want to assume that we actually have homogeneous ideas as quote, contributors to this, to this book about uh, the Marcasian problem. We all agree that Laden was wrong. That's, that's pretty much all that we have in common. The rest is, uh, is up for grabs. Yes, Mark. Something sort of common among you, and maybe that's also common to us. Uh, so, his nice positive proposal was that we should worry about, we should want theories or projects or whatever they are that are epistemically reliable, right? That's sort of his positive approach to dealing with judging theories instead of the honorific science, not science. Now, in some of your suggestions, though, it seems that you guys are sort of saying, oh, what we're worried about is good epistemic standard. So Massimo's example of people not believing in evolutionary theory, well, they've got to show that those are epistemically warranted theory. In Carroll's presentation, historical sciences, oh, those are epistemically warranted theories. In, um, I don't in Martin's presentation at the end there, you're interested in the normative question, which sounds like epistemic norms. So, I don't know. It seems that you like loud. <laughs> Um, I, I would disagree with that, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah, Latin wants necessary and sufficient conditions. Uh, and these are going to give you a crisp distinction. Uh, it's something either a science or it's not a science. <laughs> and I think that we all agree that that kind of distinction is not uh, Sorry, science. You all disagree with his negative arguments, but I'm saying you sort of agree with his positive argument that really what we're interested in is epistemic I, I do agree with that. Well, I do also, but I will go back to the first question in that case, from, from my perspective, which is, yes, we agree with the positive project, except that, in my opinion, there are uh, regularities in that positive project. It's not ad hoc, and it, if you read Ludden's uh, uh, paper, it doesn't seem that that's what he's hinting at. He's simply saying, um, as the first question was, was suggesting, well, you know, we'll look at this and we'll see what happens, we'll look at that and we'll happen. To me, that is just not sufficient. I mean, that, that, that um, gives you this impression that you're just making up stuff as you go. Um, and I do think there are regularities, just because the regularities are not as sharp as one might want them. Um, that, you know, part of the project is to identify those regularities to, to, and to modify them, to see also how they modify through time, uh, incidentally, which is why, again, we have the historical component to it. But, I mean, I can see your point, but, but I think there's more to both the positive and the negative project there. And, and let me just notice that Loudon uh, rejected historical knowledge yeah. as uh, legitimate scientific knowledge, which I, I find that just baffling because, as I said, you know, we actually have really good information about uh, a lot of historical aspects of uh, our science. <coughs> we have time for one or two more questions. Yes. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> Your question was already asked. Okay. Yes. Was it answered? So one of the questions I just wanted to ask was, so it seems as though you're working with a very fixed conception of what the kind of these target of science is that you want to try to use it. I think in response to some of the questions that were raised earlier, it seems like what you've got is a contrast between certain kinds of practices which lie outside accepted sociological standards and trying to theorize, trying to offer explanations, and so on. And so what's interesting about the case of Newton is that you think that at the time that Newton was about, there isn't anything like even approximate what we would consider to be a good scientific practice in place at the time that Newton was to theorize. Take the case of homeopathy. Homeopathy as a way of treating was actually quite effective at the time because the current medical practices were really harmful. Right? <laughs> because the idea of doing nothing with the placebo effect was actually good. Yeah. So from the point of view of making predictions that were effective, we might, on this kind of conception of making positive interventions that are beneficial, class homeopathy at the time of its development mm -hmm. as something kind of quasi-scientific. Now, since we've got you know, contemporary medical science, we want to put it in the other way. Mm -hmm. But it seems like what we've got then is this term science as, I know philosophers don't like this notion, 
but as a socially constructed term of a kind of way of theorizing and talking and providing explanations, that is itself a shifting target. And what we do with the science pseudoscience debate is take into account of deviance from accepted social conventions, the intentionality of the actors, and the kinds of theoretical content right. and the things that they do. Yeah. But, but I think the problem is this: that what you think, what you seem to, to, to hint at as a problem, I see it as a rich source of, of research. That is, you brought in very nicely uh, the historical component of it. Uh, we just need to stop. If, if somebody's still doing that, we just need to stop thinking of science as something that doesn't change over time. Um, and uh, by the way, that is a problem that sometimes uh, a mistake that sometimes even well-known historians of science make. I mean, one of, once you, when you go to even just you know the, the standard Kuhnian example of paradigm shift, you have oh well, it's transition between Ptolemaic astronomy and Copernican astronomy, as if in fact astronomy under Ptolemy was anything like what we need what we mean today by astronomy. It's a very different kind of, of, of enterprise which uses very different kinds of standards and so on and so forth. So, so you may look at it negatively and say, well, that's a problem. That the standards are changing over time. I see it as a source of a research project. Yes, they are. Now, along which direction? And you know, why is it exactly that? Well, may I, but you may have actually qualified. In my talk, I did say, you know, there are some things that may have shifted back or forth, and then will shift again. Um, uh, you know, and that to me is a, is a source of wonder and interest rather than, than a problem necessarily. And I think it's, I think you're right, but I think that's, you said to me, which is an argument why when doing this um, work as philosophers, we should not uh, be uh, limited to the, the uh, traditional uh, definition or the or usage of the term uh, science, which has, uh, as you mentioned, as a sort of subtraction, but look at more important underlying uh, stemming. If, I mean, for instance, I often use an example of numismatics that's counted as a uh, science, and philatelic that is not counted as a science. So there's really no good reason why there should be such a difference. So we should look for a philosophical distinction that explains that difference and process for sociological uh, reasons which I've mentioned. But also with regard to uh, homeopathy, I, I don't think that the, the standards have changed over time. I think they, they did, but not in the case of uh, homeopathy, it's just a contingent fact of history that when homeopathy was first proposed, that the theories or the practices that had been beat with were actually harmful, more harmful. And so it is precisely in virtue of the fact that uh, there was, uh, that homeopathy uh, is, um, you know, um, does not work, it cannot um, uh, warrant its, uh, its call to place, that, it, that we have the impression that it was actually better than its competitors. Uh, but the, 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 the standards themselves didn't change. It. As soon as we, it's just a, a matter of using the, the traditional practices at the time as a baseline, and then having the impression that homeopathy did better. Uh, as soon as we sorted out that problem, I mean, the, the cause of claim of homeopathy have never been aesthetically, uh, aesthetically warranted, not today and not uh, a century ago. I think with regard to chronology, for example, we have a more uh, the, the, the difficult story. But the homeopathy, I would say, this is what, this is a very clear cut case. It's just. Whole, you know, just one thing, false positive. That's what's going on. Right. Yeah. Uh, guys, this is what, oh, sorry, we're, we're out of time. Um, thanks very much for, for coming. Uh, we, we need to remind you that there is a reception in uh, 15 minutes. That's just one, uh, one floor down. Thanks very much.